All right, thank you very much everyone for joining us on this very sunny day in London, actually. I'm very happy. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nimod Vadi. I'm the founder and creative director at Arbeit Gallery um, based in East London. If you haven't visited us, please do come around. We have a great show on by Ben Grosser at the moment. Arbeit is a gallery, a non-for-profit gallery that commissions artists working in the intersection of digital practice, new technologies, and critical thinking. In 2020, we've launched our uh, Arbeit Skills that offers introductions to creative software and short course classes on digital theory led by artists and curators working in the digital realm. So far, we've done workshops on coding, 3D designing, sound editing, as well as cross-platform game engines and virtual world making. And these creative courses were made to fill a gap we saw for short but in-depth peer-to-peer learning something in between of a YouTube tutorial and university short course, all via a supportive network of like-minded people. The course are always, courses are always small, which gives participants a, a chance to receive more personal and hands-on approach in more friendly and engaging environment. The aim of the workshops is for participants to live with skills they can apply in their creative development. Um, we're welcoming you to the third and final um, workshop that we've programmed in collaboration with the Serpentine as part of their second iteration of future uh, ecosy art ecosystems. And this time is with Kaiken. Um, Kaiken are a cross dimensional collaborative practice whose practice merges the physical with the digital by bu building online worlds and augmented realities for you to experience often through face filters hosted on Instagram. And today they will be taking you through some exciting workflows of character design and implementation within your own 3D worlds. Uh, we also have Eva um, Jäger is uh, here with us today and she's from Serpentine. We'll share a bit more about the future art ecosystems. So yeah, I'm Eva Jäger. I'm associate curator at Serpentine Galleries, where I work on the R&D platform team. It's an initiative to operationalize research, specifically artistic research within the art field. Um, we're also producers of Future Art Ecosystems, which is an annual strategic briefing. The idea behind this uh, work is to provide concepts, references, a kind of language and a series of arguments that can be integrated into operational ag agendas for cultural infrastructure. Um, on July 6th, the team, along with so many amazing contributors, including Kaiken, uh, published second uh, issue of Future Art Ecosystem, which focused on art in the metaverse. So we were interested in how metaverse infrastructures might interface with the art world. And uh, for those of you who are less familiar with the term, it's an always online, persistent, spatial, uh, second world. Uh, some people call it web, web um, 3.0, which represents a fundamental shift in our notion of digital systems and presence. And it will require new skills in order to grasp its implications. I'll drop a link to the uh, PDF of the report in the chat. So as part of our exploration of this um, and, and focusing on these sort of operational agendas, we wanted to make sure we provided something for artists. Um, and that's the series of technical workshops focused on art making in the metaverse. So uh, in our session with Danielle, we, we learned to sort of develop the structural foundation of a game. So who we're making the game for, how it would be, how the you know viewer would be, or player would be brought into the game, um, what the tools for interaction would be. In our second session, um, we moved into the game engine, exploring dynamic environments in Unity with uh, Chris McGinnis. And then today, our final session with Kaiken, they'll walk us through building characters um, who might inhabit the environments that we make in Unreal Engine. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this session and I don't want to take up any more time. So I'll hand it over to Tanya. Hi everyone. Hey. <laughs> so um, how we are going to start is we thought we'd spend the first like 30 minutes or something talking a bit about um, like our, like what we make. So you understand a bit, understand our practice a little bit and like where, what, we're, what angle we're coming from. And then we'll um, explain um, character design and also just like kind of the certain like, I guess like 
along the way the learning processes and the way how we discovered to create character design because it we really do feel like it's like a ongoing process so it's like you can see like where like when we haven't we don't know how to do something how we've like done a trick to make it feel like you've done that when you haven't or something like that mm -hmm. and then we'll also actually take you through um how to create a virtual production so like how to um how to basically make a cgi film so just show dissect the process for you and then we'll go into the character design and make show you how to make um meta human how to bring it into the gaming engine and then also how to export it as a film so we're kcan um so we create gamified experiences and we our work is really like focusing on like how to care for and how to like understand and uh critique and explore the metaverse and i guess like we do this in like lots of, we create it in lots of different forms so we create gamified performances we create films games and we use a lot of xr technology so we use like ar vr but we also create our own technologies or work yeah. with startups to develop their technologies so it's kind of like lots of different things but when you're working collaboratively you end up going in lots of directions yeah. <laughs> inevitably because <laughs> you need to fulfill everyone's needs um, <laughs> uh, i was just gonna add as well like it's, it's me and hannah and izzy who izzy isn't here with us today but she's here in spirit but yeah like we were saying we always collaborate with many different people from many different fields um, and almost all of our projects are never without collaborating with someone else mm -hmm. um so that's something that's really important to our practice and our process especially with character design too because a lot of yeah. the for us like we once we started doing cgi like we made that very like deliberate decision of like we realized the weight of like what happens when you create a digital identity and like what is like the weight and the value of that like how do you make it emancipatory how do you um how do you portray people's inner worlds in a more accurate way? Like, how do you liberate people? How do you do you not uh, continue or perpetuate some systems or something and stuff like that? So we're really, uh, like, we do feel like quite a like responsibility. So often the characters we're working with are with other people and we're working with them and like nurturing our like collaboration to get to the point that we all really create this character and we, like symbolize and evoke them the way that they feel comfortable and happy with. Um, we'll just show you a couple of works that we've been working on recently. Page are just kind of like works that are we've just kind of really like launched or not launched, maybe just like made physical. <laughs> um, and also like projects that are kind of still in, in process at the moment. So the video that Hannah's just started playing in the top right hand corner is just um from our recent installation at Heck in Basel, where we created a, a game that you can play. So it's actually, it was originally a game that you can play online. So um, later on, we can actually share the link so you guys can have that and you can play it if you want to. But we actually, for this exhibition, we kind of uh, transformed it into, from an online game into a game that can be played physically in space. So if you see in the top left-hand corner image, um, you can see there's a big projection and then in front there's this pool of water which actually really beautifully like reflects the, the projection into it so um, and then there's this kind of raised platform above the water where uh, visitors of the gallery can come and sit down and you can see that the person in the image is actually interacting with something on the screen and that's actually an iPad which we uh, we've used as a kind of controller or, or kind of like a trackpad so that you can interact with the game from the seating area. Um, so the game is actually a multiple choice walking narrative game. So you kind of have to go through each level and then you're confronted with like a, you're confronted with these different um, kind of like narrative choices and you have to choose in which direction you take so there's like whether you choose the direction of the moral um the moral high force or the human god or to become a divine mother so while you're playing the game you don't actually really know which um which direction you're taking but you can kind of follow along with it in that you can see in the bottom of the projection there's actually a little map um, 
so the kind of the purpose of the game or kind of like one of the main things that happens during the game is you collect these wisdom tokens um and so every time you reach a new a new level or where there's a new environment there's new symbology there's new characters maybe um you'll be collecting these wisdom tokens um and what we made available in the physical installation is that you can actually um, download your wisdom tokens by a generative QR code and you can take those wisdom tokens away with you. Um, so you can keep them and you can see their details, see their values, see their traits. I guess so like what we were doing with it was that we were, that we made this game in April, like the, it was released, I think, the first of April. So it's very much the height of when um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens were released. And also with like, obviously the blockchain becoming more within the mainstream. And one thing that for us, we were really reflecting on was the idea that non-fungible token, what that means is that it's like an asset that is like, it's unique. So what we already think, and that now it can be like, uh, it can be integrated into society as something valuable that's like, uh, maybe it's something that's more ephemeral, for example, like digital works. And, but for us, what was really important was that these tokens were called wisdom tokens. So the idea is almost like, kind of a bit like, it feels a bit like Pokemon. It has like a poster of all the different tokens you can collect. The idea was like, how could you like potentially implement wisdom onto the blockchain as a form of currency? So like how, what happens in the future if we have something like the blockchain and we can um, basically kind of change the kind of like the, the game of the earth. So like, what do we do on the, like we, we exchange through finance and through money and that creates a certain system. It creates certain values and certain like, um, it perpetuates certain like modes of power. So our idea was like really thinking about well, what happens if we could implement stuff like wisdom? What happens if we could um, put the wisdom of our ancestors onto the blockchain and that, that could be used as a form of uh, currency? But obviously it's like an all non-fungible token and how would that change our systems and the game that we're playing ultimately? Um, so that's really what we were trying to explore and also propose in that very like, um, that very like kind of explosive time where people like it like the blockchain is uh engineered finance like it, it that's what it is it's, it's all about finance so it's like for us that's like we're, we're we're stepping back from that and like thinking of a new way of operating in that on, on the blockchain in a like a emancipatory way and then down below you can see there's also this is an install that's going to happen in the next month at Thailand Biennale and that this is just like as you play the game there'll be a there'll be the map as a sculpture and as you play the game you can track where you're going so um and then a couple of other pieces we've been working on is just we created this series called the life game and that one is like again a touchpad controller but it has implemented reward systems as you watch the interactive series very similar to twitch and again it's like looking at these technologies that are actually they're really seeping into our day to day and also like the younger generation for example like twitch and even instagram now they're like creating reward systems and like i don't know if um you know like like when like sapiens happened the book sapiens came out and there's yovanal harari and he's talking a lot about narratives and everyone like it's a very general like thing to now say that the narratives like shape like we need to believe in narratives and that shapes the way we think and feel and believe and we need them to guide us in society but actually we need game structures too to guide us in society so we're looking at the ones that are existing and starting to seep into society and like Kind of commentating on that and then the last mm -hmm. one that we're working on at the moment which is like a haptic room which we can show you more about in later but that room is a um basically it's a wearable technology and inside it has like sound and um haptics and what's really amazing about this technology we're creating is that when you're wearing it it feels like the sound comes from inside you so what happens is that when you it, it, it's kind of a great simulator for creating like first-hand experiences so you can implement an experience that's not your own and then you can um and then it feels like you are embodying that experience as if it's someone else experiences going inside you from the first-hand perspective if you get what I mean um 
maybe we can go to the next one. Yeah, I think so. Just a few of our installations. Yeah, so we just thought we'd just like briefly show you some of the things that we often do, kind of like multi-channel um, video installations, but like this, um, sometimes they'll have like an augmented reality counterpart, like that's quite important to the work or like with this work that um, is on the screen now in the previous image, we actually, um, we screened a film that we made called Film and Metaverse and then um, kind of seamlessly transitioning from that film screening, we went into a live motion capture performance, which is really just like a very gamified performance because it really required a lot of like audience participation and like audience collaboration as well. So we um, we created this controller, which was actually like a website that um, the audience could visit on their phone. So was, the URL is yourcontroller.live, which is actually still active. Like you won't be able to actually interact with the game because the game was the live, but you can actually kind of have a little play with it anyway. But, oh, sorry, did you want to say something else? Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was just going to say, so the purpose of the controller was really, um, it was really very simple. It only had a few interactions. So the game had six levels, and each level required the audience to actively um, press a button multiple times. So each time you press the button, um, a kind of, a soundscape would come out of your phone maybe for five, 10 seconds or so. And so as everybody in the space is pressing the buttons, it creates this like reactive audio landscape in, in, the, in the actual space. Um, and because people are pressing constantly, it really kind of creates this kind of like building of energy and, and like sound in the room. And the interactivity was is that when you press the button, it actually activates and triggered changes in the virtual environment. So you can kind of see in the background, there's kind of like some embers and there's a waterfall and some trees, but depending on which level you were in, your collective participation would, would actually, um, for example, cause a forest to grow, or maybe in the next level, all of your pressing the button actually causes a forest fire, to, which destroys the forest. Um, and then you have to work together in the next level to press the button to, um, to kind of like extinguish the fire. So maybe. really, oh, sorry, <laughs> you go. <laughs> I was gonna say like maybe more like a bit of the concept conceptually, yeah. like what that meant. So like, for example, when Tani was saying about the one, one level you're pressing the button and you create a forest and the other level, the forest burns. And it's almost like how, especially online, it's like how our micro actions can create macro impact. So one minute you're you're doing something that you feel like is positive. And then the next second you as the audience are like kind of like without even realizing something bad happens. And then you feel like collectively like responsible of that. So it kind of allows people to think about like micro actions and macro impact and in that relationship to technology and also nature and the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and then here's like another um, motion capture performance where we screened for my metaverse at the ICA and it seamlessly went into a interactive 360 live stream <laughs> performance which we worked with Offworld to debut their technology for the first time. So when they were starting with their plugin for Unreal Engine, we were kind of their guinea pigs. So what we'd do is we'd propose um, what we wanted, the tools they wanted to create to develop their technology, and then they'd develop it. And by doing that, they would like, it would help develop their overall product. And um, what we did was that people, this stream is actually the stream from the gaming engine, which is also streamed onto Facebook at the same time as a 360 video. Mm -hmm. And people go onto Instagram and they could press the emojis. And if you can see at the top here, you can see the emojis and they're filling up as you, um, as the more people press those emojis. And once it's fully full, then an interaction will appear. So what happens is it's almost like, again, like collective world building to make changes. There will be no change in the environment if nobody participates. But what was also good is that, or interesting was that, for example, we had someone from like Marrakesh who was playing at the same time, who wasn't in that space. But so it's kind of like, again, playing with these, like, um, I guess we're just really experimenting with what could we do <laughs> um, with these different <laughs> tools and technologies um, to discover our own technologies. Um, 
Do you I think if you go on the next slide, you can actually see like, um, yeah, it was so on Facebook, you can kind of see, you can press the different like interactions like life or heart or, and each of those, yeah, it just like activated something in the environment. Um, so yeah, it really was like kind of a said, just experimenting with this like very fledgling technology and trying to see what we could do in a space with people virtually and physically. Mm -hmm. And again, I guess maybe like uh, Facebook is something for like online communities, but then this is like a digital kind of community building in like a strained way using like, I don't know, like using something that's very corporate, but then also there was a lot of like freedom within that space. So for example, when Sakina was in the motion captures, like she's moving so fluidly, like you can't move within a digital space, like normally so fluidly. So um, yeah, and also just like live, like the future of like how we interact with live um, visuals and performances and events. Um, then now this is like, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about like, avatars and like how we create our avatars. So this was a performance we did in November um, with um, Nama Etel and also her baby in her womb. So um, Yanni. <laughs> Yanni. Yanni. So here you can see. And so what we did was we, um, we just like, I guess we actually just did a call out and um, asked if anyone was pregnant and wanted to perform with us. And, um, <laughs> And I was like, yay, <laughs> me. And I'm like, okay, cool. It was really nice, actually. It was really like, um, we connected so fast. Yeah, um, it was really organic. And so we asked her, like, we kind of told her, like, what technologies would you, um, this is how we can use a technology. So for example, you can be attached to like multiple characters. So what would you like to do? And she said that she wanted to bring back she said that her grandma's always there in her presence. So we decided to do a bit of a Kanye and bring her grandmother back to life, um, <laughs> which we could maybe explore the ethics of that. I feel like it's with consent that <laughs> it's her grandma. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also created um, her present self. And then we created like her, we call it Bambi. So it's like a future kind of non-human, but also thinking about the future of Yanni too yeah. and it's almost like a ritual performance which again like um, I guess like some of it is also thinking of like ancestors and technology and, yeah um, because um Nama's history or like Nama's kind of like context at the time of this performance especially was that she was um so she's actually uh she's Israeli and she's um, Jewish and her family were actually from uh, I think both from Austria and Germany and they obviously fled during uh, the World War II and she grew up in Israel and then eventually she moved to Austria to study and then now she lives in Berlin and at that point she was she was pregnant and she kind of felt like she'd in some way through her ancestry she'd come full cycle back to her roots almost um, and so part of this world that we created with her was something this the space that was really kind of very like deeply personal to her um, and one that is beautiful but actually it also was there as a in, in kind of an effort to communicate to her future child like the, the complexities of the world and how everything is not always like good basically um, so yeah maybe we can play a bit of well, kind of yeah thing. so Nama also sings um, a lullaby that her mum used to in Hebrew that she her mum used to sing to her as a child Thank you. 
So what we're going to do now is like, so we're going to show you like and talk about like how um, how we started with CGI and maybe some of the ways in which we got to certain points. And so this is like, this is almost like how do you develop a character before you've even made the character in CGI? And like, what are the certain things that you could, you might like get stuck on, but how you can overcome those um overcome any of those like uh things so like what we were going to show you was like the trailer to film my metaverse which was the film that we created in 2019 it was the first cgi film we made so you can kind of see the like aesthetic now to the aesthetic later on so you can mm. kind of fit, see how the characters have actually developed and also so that we can explain the virtual production um later on because uh because we really want to show you we think that like basically when you're creating a character it's not just about making the character itself it's often like how you it's like how everything comes together is so much to do with the character itself so we want to be able to explain that so that you can well we felt like this was one of the most valuable things for us when we were um when we were learning the process as soon as we understood this we we're like oh my god like we have if a only, yeah there. And also kind of in a way, like if only we'd known so many things at the beginning that would have kind of prevented a lot of like trauma with CGI. <laughs> CGI trauma. Yeah. <laughs> CGI. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can hear it, right? Yeah. It's hard to be responsible of so many lives. I have a molecular and cosmic responsibility. I have roots. I've been thinking about how apples became extinct in this reality. Why do you think that is? In palm, you can only take one bite, and then you have to throw it away. Throw away what? Actually, I can stop here. So, like, for example, in this bit, so at the time, like, if you can see, like, none of the faces, like, move at all. And I'll also show you another bit. So when we first started doing character design, we you, we basically um, decided to work with form capture, which they're, um, they're really, really, really lovely. But what we realised is basically we did a scan of, the, of their faces because we wanted to, to, we didn't know how do we create somebody's real face. Like, how do we replicate that? So what we did was we did a scan, but what the problem with that is it costs so much to rig it and it's very hard to like rig it yourself. 
because so you end up with just like muscles a... there are in your yeah. face. Um, so what we yeah. did was none of the characters really had any facial mo movements apart from the ball character, which was this one. And we had a reason why this one was a ball character because it was conceptually part of it. But if you notice in this bit here, it's like we couldn't do that much motion capture because we didn't really know how to do it. So if you just rewatch this bit, it's like it goes to eat the apple. And what we've done is we just created a sound effect. So it's not actually at the apple. We've just hid the camera as if it looked yeah. like. You've moved well, the camera it, and yeah, made yeah, it so look as though, made it feel as though it's being this and that. Actually, yeah. Kind of like hiding all the imperfections. Actually, so it doesn't even fine. look like it. it just like you're trying to mesmerize the people into the like surrealness and just move the camera around to and evoke it so like a lot of the time it's about not actually being able to do it it's about being able to like fake it <laughs> so that, but, it is, but it is like about the emotional it's like what, what is the essence of that how apples became extinct on this reality why do you think that is in palm, you can only take one bite, and then you have to throw it away. Throw away what? The apple, duh. So that's the chain. Um, so yeah, and then again uh, here. So like um, again, like like we said, the characters we couldn't move their faces. Actually, maybe it's oh, fuck. Second. Um, okay. So you can see actually um, here, you can also see, so what we've done is we needed to like, this was quite an emotional part of the film. So what we did was instead of uh, making the character so that you can like, um, instead of making it so that we have the facial expressions because we couldn't do that, we just move. So instead of like, for example, if you want to do a nod and you don't have the animation for the facial animation for a nod, you just move the camera as if it's nodding and then it will feel like it's nodding. So this is like an example of it, which this is really good to know, because like, for example, obviously we're going to teach you the metahumans, but you don't know what, you might decide, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I want it to look more non-human. So if you want to make it look more non-human, so for example, I think someone said they work in ZBrush. So mm -hmm. what you could do, if you want to animate your character, you don't need to animate your character to begin with. You could just film it as if you were making the facial expressions. See this bit? So can you just see that bit where it turns? That's not, that isn't the actual um, face moving or the head moving, that's the camera moving as if it's making that kind of expression. Yeah, I guess we just wanted to share some of the hacks that we've had we had to come up with from the beginning of our like understanding of, of virtual production and character creation because it's there's so I think when you're first starting out there, there can be so much to learn. It can be quite overwhelming, even just understanding what basic kind of elements are, like rigging, for example. We just had no idea of what that was. But yeah, we wanted to show that it's still like really possible to create these really emotive scenes with very kind of little. And then also we just wanted to share with you just like a small, like, I guess part of making the film was like obviously picking the characters and making sure they were like, you're really developing a relationship with whoever. Um, if you're gonna use somebody's identity that's not your own, like what are the implications of that? And also like, is it based off someone you know? And if so, what is their story or how can that technology be used in an emancipatory way? So for example, um, Linda and Sakima, they, Linda, um, Roka and Sakima Crook. So Sakima played Pando, which is, they had multiple avatars. And then Linda played O, which is this avatar. And 
with uh, what was really beautiful about their relationship together was that, um, so Sakima is trained as a professional dancer and is an activist and a model. And then Linda used to be a professional dancer um, and she uh, she's Italian. She moved to London when she was 17, 18 or something. And she, she pretty much performed like everywhere. She was like really successful. And then suddenly when she was 19, she woke up and she just couldn't move her body. And she has this rare, uh, rare disease where like, basically she was in hospital, I think for six months, but she, um, she it's like a, um, it's like she still has it, but it's, it definitely is. Um, so basically what happened was that she hadn't actually danced since um, it happened and that was 10. So when we were working with her, it was like 10 years later. And this is the first time she danced with Sakima and she mirrored, um, was mirroring Sakima. So Sakima was like, uh, um, was there guiding her and helping her like, feel comfortable and safe. And then we recorded her motion capture in a um, motion capture studio. So one of the things that we did when we first started was we actually worked with um, Target 3D, which is a motion capture studio. And that was super helpful because having someone who understands motion capture, who's really, especially like if you tell them like, oh, I'm doing this project, like blah, blah. And if it's for good reasons and it's for something that that is like, yeah, for the good reasons, I think, like, often, like, that would, like, they're I'm willing sure to help you, yeah, and or, like, how they yeah. can, yeah, yeah, or, like, even just asking questions, because even, like, having that experience really helped form, like, our understanding of motion capture, because we could ask a professional, mm. and this is the, And then also just like studying people's form is another thing that's really important to us. So like uh, when we did the performance, we um, worked with um, Sakima to also, when we did the film for My Metaverse, we also did a live performance. And like one thing that's really important to us is actually just um, studying the form and studying someone else's practice to understand the body and how it and works. Making them. sure that there's there's space for them in the collaboration as well, like we really nurture each other's kind of interest and, and like what we'd like to do. So and yeah. And this is more just like learning through performance to create the motion capture. And also again, this is the haptic womb. So like understanding the architectural womb and working with technologies to like develop um, an understanding of um the inner world mm -hmm. and the body to get to the point that we um yeah we understand this is Izzy <laughs> the way she's here and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just having a little nap <laughs> really enjoying it it's so comfortable that haptic room is really nice and then here's some of the cgi we've been doing more recently which isn't in um it's not done through meta humans done through character creator but that's using a paid software is mm -hmm. very similar like the outcome that you can make is very similar to the meta humans yeah I would say there's like between like um both meta humans um as a character creation software and character creator which is a real illusion software um they both are like you can have really amazing outputs but actually there's there's a lot of limitations to both of them that like for example with with meta humans you can create an amazing high fidelity character for free but actually you can't you will we'll demonstrate this later but you're actually very limited on body type and actually you can only really stay within the bounds of like human forms whereas with character creator um we there's a plugin that allows you to work with zbrush so we connect the two together and that allows us to create like more non-human forms more kind of like imagined um bodies and, uh, and bodily architectures as well um so yeah there's really lots of different kind of like uh there's lots of different benefits to both like i would say actually that the meta human interface for example 
is really intuitive and that's like it makes creating characters so easy and really fun it's quite like relaxing and enjoyable process whereas in character creator it's a lot more like fiddly time consuming um so yeah but we'll we'll go through that later yeah we just wanted to kind of show you some of them, yeah these are like heads and like characters so we've like you can kind of see that they're a bit like non-human again mm -hmm. the hair like using groom which actually so one thing that the meta humans does for you which is incredible is it creates a it can create a groom if you have pc mm -hmm. so it will import a groom directly for you but what groom does which is really amazing it creates a very realistic like textured hair which is quite it is somewhat like revolutionary within character design that now people use grooms rather than using like um, hair cards or yeah. just like an object of a hair which looks very very static um yeah it's a bit like hairdressing yeah <laughs> um, and you can also make the grooms inside of like software like blender for example like i've only ever used blender to make a groom and that's a free software and it's actually not not so difficult there's lots of really great tutorials on yeah. how to do that and how to then bring that into unreal and like animate it as a like movable dynamic object and another thing that you can also do in Unreal is you can create like post-processing effects. So this is a cell shader, so it turns the characters into anime. So what's really great is also like you can then add another effect to like change your character completely differently to a complete different like aesthetic if you want through post-processing. We can go through like our virtual production kind of, not it's not timeline, I don't know, diagram. <laughs> And then we'll like, then we'll shape it up a bit and we'll do something a bit more yeah. practical. But if anyone has any thoughts or questions or just wants to like say anything, like please feel free to. Don't wait for us. Don't wait until the end. Like we're really happy to ask questions as we go along. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Is there any questions in the chat? Let's just see. I don't uh, think so. No. What was the cell shader from? So the cell shader is like a post-processing volume um, in Unreal. You can get them from the, the, the Epic Games marketplace, like you can download pre-made ones, but it's actually not that complicated to make. I mean, actually, Hannah, you can speak, but we can say that because I didn't make it. So yeah. yeah, it's like, it's kind of like you, the thing is, is like, it really depends what like computer you're, wear, you're wearing, you're using of. I really love it. I'm wearing a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so like basically with a cell shader, it's like, so for example, if we were from a PC to a Mac, it's like when Tani was sending me her cell shader, it wouldn't work the same way. So what's, what's quite good is either you can do tutorials online to create your own using visual coding within um, Unreal and you can create your own or you find ones which you combine them so you can add in multiple post processes and layer them or you can find an existing one and you can try to like hack your way and like edit one. Um, so that's also helpful or you can download one. Um, but mm -hmm. that's just, the post processing within Unreal is really incredible. Like it's such a, you can basically change the lens or- Yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah, or you can change the camera effects, whether that's like more post-processing, like Yeah. Things, and you can also do things like distortion, like you can create kind of like like a almost like if you had like a concave window or, or mirror like over over it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um maybe so like trying to recall them would be futile, as though Vaseline had been smeared all over my viewport. I thought to myself, this can change. So I created a technology which allows like us to that. That's the distortion. dreams on our own terms. Yeah, so this it's I named this technology Dream Time Life Simulation. So if you see oh yeah, French. So basically, like, did you see that it was all like, like really blurry? That's a post processing. Um, te uh, like we just, I just like coded a post processing like effect, and then this also this bubble is like a fisheye. But I've like, again, I've like played around with the coding to like make it almost like a small bubble inside the. Um, so it's actually the camera lens doing that. 
Mm -hmm. um, which is also really great because what you can do then is you can save these post-processing effects and just import them into different projects so you've always got like this kind of almost like array of different like potential like um, effects that you can add and layer on and which is great also for your character design like you can see here just you can like very much have one character but completely change its form through post-processing uh, and just the environment itself or anything so so one thing that we think is so valuable when learning how to do um, CGI characters because it's, it's really not just about creating a character it's like how do you make something like refined how do you make something like uh, how do you like um, make things make sense to not just yourself but to other people <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so for us this is like how we do virtual production so it's very much based on the production of um, the production traditional production of filmmaking mm. and we thought that this would be like this is to us like if we had known this straight away this would be the most um helpful thing for us when we're making film yeah it really breaks down the process in a way that makes it really manageable for you because you always kind of know what your output like what the final form it wants to be like if you want it to be a film or something but actually it's quite a complex process, even if you're doing something quite simple, like you always have to go through all of these six stages, even to some to small degree. Yeah, so even if you're like working with a character, a meta human, you're gonna have to do some of this process, even if it's a smaller video. So yeah. um, first thing is what you do is you just like, well, this is how we do it. You can obviously do it, you can adapt it. It's not, this is a structure that as soon as you, you can like, you can just choose to not do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, we thought it would be helpful. We can also share this uh, narrow board with everyone afterwards, so you can just come back and look at it in your own time as well, but we'll just go over it to um, yeah. just outline everything, really. So this is how, we, so we start with like outlining concepts. So like, what is our concept? What's the idea? Like, what is the framework of like what we're thinking about? And then we create like a production timeline and a budget, and then, from there, we create a storyboard, a mood board, or uh, or a video mood video. So this is this is really helpful depending on like how structured. So if you want to create a narrative that has sequences and is really like a film structure, a storyboard is really great because a storyboard like allows you to create like a narrative sequence. Whereas a mood board, if you want something a bit more abstract in terms of like visual aesthetic, just creating a mood board to like, outline like how you visually want to perceive or see the, it or see the world come together. A mood video is really good. So you just literally take found footage or anything you want and you make a video and you basically create the expression of, um, you basically create the like emotional expression or the like pace or the like vibrations or feelings of what you imagine this piece to be. Um, and that is a really helpful piece to like frame and have all your, um, have everything ready so that you're ready to kind of go into the stages of making um, and then you do the casting or location scouting which can be digital or physical so either you're scouting as in like online you're finding characters or physically you're trying to find people to work with to like create their characters or work with them or you're trying to find like references of characters you want to build that may be non human and then with the location scouting is like the idea is like you're finding what kind of environment you want to be working in or um, you might be finding assets online on like say unreal uh, marketplace like assets you want to buy um, and then then the next stage is the art department which is the like set design and the character design and this is like the, the different ways in which you can do it so this is this is what's really helpful is to like know don't do all of it from scratch or like this is how we would advise like unless you want to spend ages try do do try to like you can you can have like stages in which you learn things um so you don't have to be like okay there's a set design so I need to model everything from scratch like that's not necessarily true so you can either make your own or you can kit bash it or alter existing objects or you can code your own or you can purchase existing objects then with the set design so you're modeling the objects your environment building you're creating materials and textures and often you're 
can be working with like effects, for example, particle systems, maybe you're bringing a video into the um, film or you're um, making a post-processing effect for it that's very integral to like the set design of the space. Um, a huge part of it often is the weather and the physics as well, because um, the difference, I guess, with the you working in a gaming engine is that you're kind of working like literally the environment is a blank paper and you're building from the sky and like maybe what weather it is, what time of day it is. Um, then with the character design, you're modeling the character, you're creating the hair, the makeup, you're styling the clothes and you're creating the materials for it and the accessories. So with the styling the clothes, you can um, either design your clothes or pattern making. So something like Marvelous Designer, or you oh. can use, I. Uh, what's the other one? That's like, uh, I forget the name of it, like Clo Clo 3D. Clo like 3D, one. yeah. 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 Which, um, yeah, but that, again, that's like a whole, in a way, that's like a whole other thing to learn or you're learning so many other things. So there are actually, you know, sometimes you might be able to find like existing digital clothes that are, are compatible with the type of character design that you're working with, which might make your process a bit simpler. And then you can just uh, alter the material of that to make it more unique so it doesn't look so, so poor, I guess. Um, but then if you're making the clothes yourself, then you're... you're we're designing the pattern in one of those like marvelous designer or close ED. And then you're actually kind of creating the dynamics of it. So it actually responds like a physical fabric would in real life. And then then there's the process of kind of like rendering that out as a as an Alembic file, or you can bring it in directly and, and work with the physics and some, something like Unreal or um even character creator to do that. Um, and then yeah like you can completely avoid that step if you just want to make it like more non-human you just attach put a texture on the body so there's like ways in which you can be like okay I'm not going to do this part this time I'm going to go for this bit yeah um, and then there's the animations the animation is really the characters the models and the sequencing so with the characters you need to have the body motion capture the face motion capture and the hand motion capture Mm -hmm. And with if you do body motion capture, you can either probably the most simplest thing to start with might be uh, you could just use Mixamo and just have a use an automatic rigging. So they yeah. So Mixamo is a free online library from Adobe, which has tons of like free animation, like already motion captured animation clips that you can download and. You can either like rig your character directly in Mixamo and then it will download the character again with the animation already included, or you can download a preset animation and retarget it in the software that you're working in. But it's honestly such a great resource and library because even though we have access to a motion capture suit and we have facial motion capture and we have those things, actually it's not always that simple. And like you normally need two or three people with you to do the, the motion capture. So sometimes using the preset ones that are freely available is it like makes your life so much easier. And I think if you're like doing a lot of CGI and you're doing a lot of character animation, you'll begin to recognize that everybody uses Mixer as well. And you can kind of identify the exact animation clip they're using. Um, so that's like kind of like any percent. <laughs> yeah. You know that that's like insider knowledge, but it's also like comforting to know that like even a lot, a lot of very like very technically skilled people still use it. So mm -hmm. it's um yeah. And then so, so you can, oh. oh sorry, yeah, I was gonna say with um for the body motion capture, there's there's several ways that you can do it. So you can rig the body manually um and animate it quite like uh manually which is uh not I would recommend that route to be honest um so and then, that's either in like a blender or cinema you just create your own bones which some of you might have already done which is great for also like objects I guess like that could be really or if you want to create something like a really non-human movement it can that's more simple that can be really for sure yeah manually. Um, and then there's also uh you can do it through AI so you can use um deep motion which is also a free software it's still free isn't it um i think free? yeah it's still free um i think that's just a limit you have to how much you can um download in, in one go 
Um, but that's pretty great because you can just take a video of someone moving in front of like a white wall, you know, make sure the camera's really static and then you um, you upload that onto their, their software, their like browser-based kind of uh, plugin and it will just rig a character for you. And it's and similarly to Nexmo, you can either download the animated skeleton directly or you can rig it to a character in uh, in deep motion. But that's also a great tool. And like I think sometimes for us the results aren't as like um, polished as we as we'd like them to be, but that's often when we're working with a very humanoid looking character. But if you are working with a character that it isn't so human, you can really like that kind of like level of detail you you can actually sacrifice because it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't affect what you're what you're showing so much um and then with the facial motion capture which we'll show you today you can actually just use like an iphone i think there is like availability like capabilities to do it on android as well but we personally never never worked with that um i wouldn't roll it out but yeah it's, it's very like i think the iphone is actually a lot uh I mean, they've interfaced everything, so it's a lot smoother for you if you're just starting out, for example. Um, it's less hacky that way, or less like tech technical. Um, and then for the same with uh, hand motion capture, there's a little device that you can get that tracks your hand movements. And then but you but like the face and hand, you can also do that manually. Um, but all, all of those aspects of body motion, facial motion capture and hand motion capture, um, there's this, these stages that you can break it down into. So that's for her source of figuring out what the movements are, figuring out how the movements you want to do, whether they actually work with motion capture or not. Then a big problem that we've experienced with uh, motion capture before is calibration. And if your suit is not calibrated correctly, then it will really create awful data that's like impossible to work with. Um, so getting calibration right at the very beginning is really essential. Um, then you figure out your animation score and you record it, and then you get to the stage where you can actually clean up the motion capture data. And that's a really normal part of mocap. Um, it's quite... Uh, Icky, maybe, and maybe not something that we're actually that good at doing, but um, it really does make a difference when it's done properly. Like you can create really smooth movements. Um, yeah, and then it's editing it into a sequence and then preparing that to bring into the gaming engine. So also with the animation score, um, what's really important is to like, so for example, if you're going to be doing the animation, you basically kind of like similar to storyboard, you need to like literally lay out and have a document which lays out every single animation you're going to create. And you need to be really methodical with the stage to get it like um, really accurate. I think again, it's like what level you're doing, but if you're doing it with like high fidelity characters that move um, fairly realistically, or even it's not even that it moves super realistically, it's literally if it's a sequence of events, um, you need to, or you're making some short film or a longer film, you you have to create really methodical lists for the animation score um, and tick it off very like orderly to be able to like just make the process a bit smoother so yeah. for example with the body face and hand motion capture often you're having to like uh unless you have um a full body suit that has the hands on it as well and you're doing it at a studio with the face rig um you're gonna have to combine them all together mm. Um, which is like, uh, can be just like a bit tedious. But so the next stage is actually like set dressing, but because we always collaborate when we're doing this, like not one, like one person isn't actually responsible for all of these things. Like I will focus a bit more on the characters and the animation and Hannah will focus a bit more on the set dressing, for example. So in working together, we're considering the animation score in relation to the set at the same time, because yeah, and I think that that's an important thing to acknowledge because if you don't do that and you create this animation and then your set is really different, you kind of have to do it again or make things work. So just good to keep that in mind. Yeah. So then when you do the set dressing, it's very much like in a film production where you're like, okay, now you've got the, everybody's like the cameras, people are there, like the actors are about to come in, we need to set up the space, you've only got two days to it, but this is great because you don't have two days to do it, you can, well, you might do, because you might be 
you might have your deadline but (laughs) (laughs) but you like basically like what it is is just like literally putting everything together so and then uh so that we know everything is set up ready to film so it's the character set up the animation set up so you don't you want to make sure the animation doesn't like go into a rock so you want to make sure everything you want to test out the sequences and making sure that everything kind of um fits all together as one thing and then the lighting set up too then you go on to the cinematics so the cinematics is the um there's a camera setup so the camera setup has the settings color grading aperture focal length and manual just dis- manual focus distance so this is like again for, which actually we, we have talked about it throughout but it is again this is all for unreal engine um you can do this in unity it will be much harder in unity in unreal it will be much easier unless you know how to use U- unity uh <laughs> For sure, Unreal will make it a hundred times easier. This setup, yeah, um, yeah, and you can do it across different platforms. The same thing that you can apply this to anything, but it is more tailored for Unreal Engine. Um, uh, so, for example, you could do it in Cinema 4D mm-hmm. as well. Um, then you have like the sequence. So you can have your camera set up. You have the sequencing. You have the editing and the sequencing, the post processing, the exporting, and the rendering. So with the sequencing, you're often sequencing the characters, objects, the sky, and the weather, or any particle system. So the other is like any sort of effects that you want that are inside the gaming engine. What um, one thing that to be uh, conscientious of is just that um, if you're creating some sort of scene and you you like just be careful of this sky dynamics because if you want it to change from one set to another set you need to consider what time of day it is or like how time changes or weather changes um then yeah you can actually edit within the sequencer so that's one Mm -hmm. thing that you can do so you don't even have to just it's not just editing within um say premiere or something it uh it's also editing within the sequencer then there's the post processing which can be the lens effect and camera effect sporting rendering then you go on to the post which again is like video editing color grading special effects so that's probably something like premiere or final cut pro and then there's the typography design if you you might work with some hard design as well because you're using gaming engines so it's like often like the aesthetic me people do lots yeah. of hard designs yeah. we, we tend to work in like after effects for those things and also for the title and credit title and intro and credits and things so that kind of is another package that yeah like yeah. kind of ties everything together at the end and finally it gets to sound design and score and also i mean uh like first it's really important when you create something really cin- cinematic but it feels really immersive as well so having like foley or really well done sound design is like essential to like carrying the visuals that we've just made I think and also the foley is important if you want to make things so like even like how the sound like so when we work with sound design it's like how does this like what sort of environment is it so how does the sound actually travel within that space you or like what would like for example if you're in a desert like how would that sound mm-hmm. actually travels so there's certain things like this again with like character design the thing that you can compensate is the sound and the sound can really make uh you can create the sound to be like much more layered rather than the the character design so that it gives off the effect or the motive feeling and then it's the exporting and once you've done the exporting you have a you seat have seen, yeah. oh. <laughs> so i thought what i'd show you guys first is kind of what is what we're aiming to get to at the end of this session and um, and I think we mentioned at the beginning that there will be like a practical activity which we'll do together but that will be entirely browser based and then the rest of the session if you have the wherewithal with your computer with the software downloaded you can follow along with me but we don't expect you to do that because we know it can be very like uh jarring sometimes doing this kind of thing online with lots of people at the same time so I'll share the process and teach you how to do it. And we'll provide you with a demo project and a step-by-step plan of like how to do it in your own time. Um, so hopefully that will be like adequate. So to start with, I just wanted to show you like just a little clip of like, um, yeah, like the final outcome. So this is like a, an animated character from MetaHumans that um, we worked on yesterday. So we kind of put it together and then 
I did some facial animation and put it up in a simple scene and sequenced it. So I'll play it now. Um, so yeah, the quality is really like, hopefully you can see over screen share that the quality is actually really, really good um, for something that we put together really quickly. Um, and also like, you know, this sequencing is, is really simple to do and it's really simple to play around with the, um, the aperture and the focus to kind of create like a very cinematic kind of short film. Um, so that's what we're aiming to do first. Um, and now I'll share this document with you. I'm actually gonna share this whole folder with you now, which has a demo project. So that's the exact same project that I'm working in right now with everything already set up. And then there's also this document, which is step-by-step -step instructions. Um, I put in screenshots to help illustrate things. Uh, but because there's like a lot of screenshots, it's, it looks like there's like 23 pages, but there isn't like 23 pages of instructions. There's just like a lot of pictures. Um, so don't be overwhelmed. Um, so first off, I think Ava shared all of this information, maybe before everyone joined um, the workshop today and also in the chat. But what we're going to be doing, like the software and the, um, the software, the plugins and the apps that we're going to be working with, are uh, firstly, of course, there'll be Unreal Engine. So um, with Unreal Engine, you'll need to create an Epic Games account if you haven't already. You'll then be able to sign up for access to use MetaHuman. So the link for that is here. And then there's a link to actually access the, the MetaHumans Creator app. So the first link is just Epic Games. And here you can like, you'll be able to get Epic Games. So you'll be able to download the Epic Games launcher and like it comes with the marketplace and everything. And you'll also be able to create an Epic Games account here. Um, then on the second link, which is linked for signing up for access, um, just on this page, I think if you scroll down, it says, yeah, request early access. Or you might even able to just go and directly from launching the app, but you will need an account to get started with that. Um, and that account is quite important because once you've downloaded Unreal Engine, um, we'll actually then also be using the software called Bridge. So Bridge is a, it's a really great software where you can, um, really easily like import like high quality free like mega scans which are like kind of textures and images that you can use for materials in your in in unreal to create like again like really high quality um materials so that's a really useful tool and bridge has uh meta humans inbuilt so that's how we build the meta humans in the browser-based software and then then we like you open up the bridge once it's downloaded. You log in with your account, and then you can like import the MetaHuman directly from there. And then finally, we'll be using some a bunch of plugins inside of Unreal. Which um, so there's a few which uh, are for Windows only, which is like I was mentioning earlier. Like the facial animation is kind of at the moment only available on Windows, but um, at least if you don't have Windows today, at least you can kind of understand the process and maybe see if it's something that you want to try. Um, you can kind of see how easy it is and maybe if it is, then you can find a friend who's got a PC you can borrow for a bit. Um, so those plugins are the iClone Live Link, the AR Kit plugins, and then the last one is for Mac and PC, and that's the HDRI Backdrop, which just allows us to create um, basically a, a 3D environment really quickly. So this is a HDRI. It's just a, a cube map that's like um, mapped onto like a 360 sphere, for example, and uh, it just means that you don't have to create a world straight away, like we've actually got a, a template to work in. Um, so, and then finally, it's the Live Link Face app, which is 
for recording the facial animation and currently that's for iPhone X and above only um, but there's a link there to download if you guys want to right now. Um, so the first exercise that we thought we'd start with is actually creating a meta human. So I'm gonna, you guys can follow along with this and we were thinking that seeing as it's browser based and like we've been talking for ages as well, maybe just to like have a bit of a break and also kind of like activate your mind again. We'll just have a play around that like I'll screen share while I'm making a character. Maybe if you guys want to, you can make a character on your end at the same time. So I'll load that up. And if just if anyone has any questions or any problems creating an account, just let me know, like write a message in the chat. And if I don't see it, Hannah, maybe you can keep an eye out. Um, so I'm, of course, already logged in. Um, right. When MetaHumans in the browser finally opens, um, you'll see that, I mean, like these are some characters that I've made or played around with, but if you haven't made any, it probably will just come up directly with Create MetaHuman. Um, so you can either go directly into editing one of the ones you previously worked in, or you can click create MetaHuman to start again. And the way it works is MetaHuman has a bunch of different um, like ready-made presets and of characters and you can kind of start with them, choose one and then, but don't worry because you won't be limited to having a character that looks exactly like that. It's just a starting point and actually they have some really powerful tools for like blending and sculpting and like, um, changing the features individually. So I'm just going to choose one to start with. Um, I might just go for the one that's already selected. So I'm just going to click, so click next. So when it first opens, you'll get to see the character. Um, there's a short animation clip that you can play kind of at all times, or you can stop it and then you'll it will go into kind of like a uh, like a generic pose where you'll get to, and when you stopped it, that's when you'll actually be able to start sculpting it. Um, so there are some kind of like, uh, this is really useful, the, the hotkey references over here. So that's just like shortcuts, which tell you how to interact. So for example, you can like, um, you can orbit the space by holding your right mouse button and rotating. You can pan by pressing the middle mouse button. Um, and zoom is obviously just a scroll wheel, things like that. It's, it's quite easy. It's really easy to pick up. So um, I think what we'll start with is I'll just show you how you can like blend the face. Um, so I think this is like a really interesting way that they've done this, this like interface of being able to blend between different characters. Um, it means that you can, I mean, there are actually quite a lot of different styles of faces they've got here, but then in terms of actually like sculpting, like we were saying, if you wanted to do more non-human sculpting or sculpting, um, like in ZBrush, for example, where you can be a lot more fluid, that's not really possible. But I do think that this is a really like great interface and it's really easy to use. So you can just like, take another character, for example, this one, and you just kind of drop it into this, like, uh, I guess these little tiny portals. Um, so maybe you take different face styles. Um, I'll just do a few so you can see. Um, and what it does is it will blend the, blend the features. It won't change, like, the skin color or the hair or anything, it will just, it will just be adapting features. So you can see right now I have like six bases to blend from. And now if I'm in the viewport here, you can see there are these kind of like little circles with dots. And when you hover over them, you can kind of like, I'll click that and hold it. And then you can see it creates the same kind of shape as the interface in the top right hand corner. And I don't know, I guess you guys can see that it's changing um, as I kind of like approach the different circles and it will blend between them. So 
it's really fun to play around with. Like, I don't know if you guys uh, have this set up on your end. Like, just feel free to like play and listen while I'm talking because I really love the fluidity of this though because it's it's really it's really dynamic and it's really it's really quite responsive to your to your mouse movements. Um, which, like I was saying earlier, I we actually don't use metahumans in our projects. Um, because we're normally working in character creator and inside character creator, um, you can do a lot more, like you're not confined to certain limitations like you are with metahumans, but the actual process of like changing the shape of the eyebrows, it's really not as dynamic or intuitive. So I think that they've, they've done a really good job. Okay, so maybe what I'll do is, um, now that I've kind of shown you how to do the blending, um, I'll show you how to do the sculpting. So you can stay in blend mode, but you just come down to here. Um, and if we select sculpt, you can see that the, it changes from having kind of like a few large points. We've actually now got many smaller points. And it's a similar process. You just select one and you can just kind of like outwardly change the you can pull it in all directions, like up, down, in, and, and right, um, left and right, and it will move dynamically with you. Um, so this is also a really easy way to just like actually have a bit more control because if you're working with the blend, the blending mode, you're actually only going between a certain number of shapes of faces. Whereas you have a bit more flexibility here to actually independently move certain aspects and like change the angle of them. Um, the other thing that you can do is like right now I have my symmetry turned on, but you can turn it off easily by coming down here and just clicking it and it turns it off. So you can see now then that if I change the, the right hand nostril, it's not, it is moving the left one a little bit, but it's not moving it to the same extent as the right one. Um, so to turn it back on, you just click there and you just go back to average. Um, so I, I really think that that's like a, something that can be really fun to play with because you can create like a very kind of sterile, really realistic looking human. But when you're working with the, the symmetry turned off, you can actually kind of create more realistic faces, I think. Um, but it's good to kind of start with the symmetry turned on because then you can do the basis and then go into the finer details like a bit later on, for example. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you guys is that, so I was just doing that with in the sculpt mode, but there's also another one which is kind of fun. You can go into move mode um, and you can see it changes from points to like sections or these kind of like lines and you just like pull and grab and you can see as you move your mouse, it kind of like changes things. So you can take a bit of time to just kind of like get to grips with how, how they actually move. But I think it's, I think it's, like quite fun to play around with. I mean, me and Hannah were doing it last night while we were on pool with one another. And I, I think we spent like a really long time just <laughs> kind of quietly playing around and yeah, it's quite fun. So the next thing I'm gonna show you is the eyes. So again, I was like, oh, like you can't even choose like the individual color, like, because in iClone you can, or character creator, sorry, you can just pick any color on the, on the spectrum but with this you have a few presets and then there is some kind of like changing that you can do so for example i'm going to click that green brown one because i think it's a bit nicer having that kind of two-tone color and then if you click on that's in the presets but then if you click in iris you can actually you have a little bit more flexibility so what i did with the character that i've got in unreal that's in the project that you guys have already got is I actually selected the eyes individually just so I could create something that maybe looks a bit more interesting. Um, so I might keep the right eye the same as it is right now, but then with the left eye, I might just kind of um, change the colors. So I maybe will go for something like quite a light blue in the center, and maybe I'll go for something a bit greener or darker around the edges. Um, I think, I suppose we like to quite make things quite non-human and quite surreal. So I guess just playing around with that is, 
it's just like up to you and your aesthetic and what you're aiming for. You can also change the patterns inside. I think because my, probably because I'm screen sharing and I'm on Zoom at the same time, my internet isn't the best. And you'll notice that the MetaHuman browser, like depending on how fast your internet, internet is, it will kind of show you like, it might be more pixelated at times. Um, but yeah, you can kind of change those patterns and you can kind of see it changing a little bit. And that's something that you'll really be able to pay attention to in Unreal in the camera sequencer. Um, so that's just a bit of eyes. You can also adjust like the whiteness of brightness of the, uh, the whites of the eyes, kind of adjust some of the, the, the rotations of the, the veins basically. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can play around with that. I'm going to leave it like that for now. I think I'm happy with that. And then the teeth, this is something that I think is quite interesting that they've done. They've given you a lot of flexibility with like editing the teeth, which I think is, is interesting that that was more of a priority than the body types. Um, but you can, um, there we go. You can you can adjust this uh, slider just to open the mouth a bit so you can see a bit better. Um, she looks a bit freaky right now. <laughs> um, but you can change this one and you'll notice it kind of like goes from being like maybe quite a straight teeth to kind of a bit more wonky or different kind of shaped teeth as well. So that's that's quite nice. You can adjust the length of the teeth. Um, you can adjust how dirty they are. <laughs> and then you can also slightly change the colors, but to be honest with you, the preset is, is kind of fine. You don't need to, I mean, feel free to play around as much as you want, but I won't go into too much detail now. Um, and you can also, you can also use these, slide, these sliders to just drag up or drag left and right to slightly change things. So feel free to do that as you like. Um, and then the next section is the makeup. So I'm actually going to come off of, you can see I'm still in move mode. So I'm actually going to go into preview mode now, which makes that interface disappear. So it's just a bit easier for me to see what I'm playing with here. Um, so this character already has this preset makeup on. So you can remove it entirely to have a more natural face, or you can kind of select one of the other ones. And to begin with, they look like quite typical makeup looks, but you can actually kind of um, play around with them quite quickly and like come up with something a bit more different. So this one, you can see that the color of the shadow is, is actually a black, but we can I don't know, we can change that to something else and then you can adjust the transparency, which will um, change how, it will just change how like thick it looks really. Um, I really like to play with the roughness and I like to pull it down to zero because it makes it shiny, which is just something that I like to look on. <laughs> um, the same with the metallic, uh, that can kind of, you can play around with that to change how shiny or how, how reflective it is really. I might keep that at one actually. Um, and that's a bit intense, so I might go for maybe just the one I was using before. It was the uh, maybe this one, the panda smudge. And I think that green's a bit much. So I mean I did on the other character I did like quite a like gold and yellow, but I might do something a bit this time. Um, let's see. A little bit more silvery this time. But yeah, so you can play around with all those settings. You can see again that there is a limitation, but you can also achieve something quite interesting, I think. Um, and then in terms of the lips, I'd say that this is a little like uh, doesn't always look the best either, but you can, there, there is more flexibility. You can, you can have a, uh, there isn't like seven colors to choose from. You can actually go for something more, um, more dynamic. So again, I kind of quite like it quite, with quite a bit of roughness to make it quite shiny um, and maybe just a bit more transparency. 
So yeah, I think I'll I think I'll stick with that for now, just so I can move on. Uh, oh, I've just seen some messages in the chat. Oh, uh, can you do under an overbite? I actually do think you can. Yeah. So if you, yeah. if you go to T, um, so it like makes her mouth pop open straight away. Um, one of these uh, icons will be able to do that. So if you do like the lower shift, actually that shifts the direction. I think it's oh, I know how you can do it. Overbite. There we go. It's that one. So if I if I rotate, maybe we can see a bit better. Another good way to visually make it look like you have an overbite is tan. If you go into, um, I think when you go into sculpt, you can also just position the. Um, you can actually change the positioning of the, uh, the draw and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Like visualization of it um, for the actual face shape. So if I go back to just blend and go into um, I was trying to move, I mean, you can you can kind of like pull the mouth out like kind of saying yeah and the chin as well. And with the sculpt you'll be able to like play around with these the little points and actually it's good to I think yeah it's good to kind of move move around in 360 while you're doing it because then you'll get a feel of how the whole um, how the whole head is looking because actually you'll notice that there are these little points in the head. So I was going to get to this next anyway, so, which is the, the hair. So there's a whole section for hair here. Um, and there are basically there are only preset hairstyles that you can choose from. But like Hannah was saying, these are really really well built and they look really realistic which is for building characters like so rare to find and they're also if you're working in a pc they are dynamic so if you animate the character and the head is moving the hair will sway with it so even though you can't really do the hairstyling yourself you do have a lot of like room for creating something that looks really good um but if i just turn the hair off for now um I think it's still over there. You can see the points on the head. You can actually even sculpt the position of the head however you like um, to a certain degree as well. So that's that's quite a good, um, good tip just to remember to rotate around your character. Um, so I might just choose, I might maybe keep the same hair that was before. Um, you're a bit limited to some extent. Um, you can go kind of like all white, which actually, if you go all white, you lose the you lose the realism in the detail. I think so. It's quite good to to either stay within the natural colours. Um, but what's quite nice as well is you can adjust the salt and pepper slider, which is basically how how much grey hair you have. Um, Snow like princess. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll just I'll just leave it like that for now, just so you can get an idea. But yeah, you can change the hairstyle. There's quite a few different things. Oh, you had this one yesterday, Hannah, which looked good. It's quite an interesting hairstyle. <laughs> Which one? That one. The one with the two buns. Yeah, I like that one. That one's nice. Yeah. It's quite we can maybe show the all the different characters we made because I can share my screen. Yeah, you can share your screen and show them. That's a really nice thing to do. Maybe we can do that. Um, oh, actually, I'll just briefly explain the other ones and then maybe we yeah. can do that so people can have a look at the kind, like, the kind of thing you can do if you can spend a bit more time with it. Um, so then uh, you can just change the type of eyebrows um, in this panel. Again, you can change the roughness, maybe how, how, uh, how much gray hair there is, or you can have uh, no eyebrows whatsoever. Um, but that's really up to you. Same with the eyelashes, there's a few presets. And again, similar settings, just roughness and salt and pepper. Um, and it's pretty good. They they actually have a lot of like beard options. So you, it works. They've separated it into moustache and beard. So you kind of do 
one section first and then you add the beard, but it means you can kind of uh, play around with the different, um, the different types of beard. Um, and the other thing I forgot to show you is the tab, which is called skin. So I'm gonna go in quite close so you can see the details. But if I just like drag along this slider, you can see that the like, the type of skin is is changing quite a lot. So some of them are quite like, like the skin feels quite rough, there's more fre freckles, there's maybe more redness, um, maybe there's more wrinkles. Some of them, I really love some of the wrinkly ones just because they feel really kind of, um, I don't know, I just really like to see the detail in it actually. Um, and then you can also adjust the, the contrast and the, the roughness of the skin too. Sometimes having the skin quite rough, uh, like with a roughness value of zero means that um, it just has this nice kind of like glowy reflection in different lighting situations. So I quite like to do that too. Um, you can play around with the freckles. Like I think when you immediately click on them, they, they look a bit, um, they don't look very well blended with the skin. So you just need to adjust the settings, maybe change the density, change the strength, um, also the saturation, and you can kind of adjust the color to match the skin a bit better. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to play around with them until you kind of get something that looks a bit more realistic. And then I really like this section as well, because it means that, I mean, this is where the realism really comes into play because you can select different parts of the face. So just like the under eye, or the chin, for example, or maybe I'll do the underline, that's a bit more obvious, but you can adjust like the redness or the saturation. I think because I've got makeup, you can't see it, so clearly it's toe totally cheeks. Um, but yeah, you can kind of create like different, uh, different kind of uh, coloring on the face, which I think is really, nice because it means again it doesn't look like just a preset thing you can kind of make it look like quite weathered or or yeah quite um yeah just different um and then finally so those are the, the main sections and then you've got the body so again like i was saying before you can just change the body type um which is yeah not that um there's not a lot that you can switch between. And the clothing is quite, uh, yeah, you've got like a jumper, a hoodie and a shirt for, for all bodies. Um, and bottoms, there's a few more options, but they're not, they're not really that, um, there's not much <laughs> room for flexibility. I think they've just randomized the color. Um, but yeah, you can kind of, choose however they've got like a primary and a, a primary and a secondary color. So there is like a bit of detail that you can play around with depending on what, what works for your character. Um, and then there's different shoes, shoes to play around with. So as you can see, there's like, there's a lot that you can do with the limit with it, within its limitations. Um, but then I would say, like uh, I can't remember who it was who asked before but I would say like the body types and below the head is where you'll maybe get the characters looking really similar but the faces and the hairstyles and the um the kind of the contours of the face is where you can really create something quite different I don't know if Hannah maybe you want to screen share quickly some of the ones you made yesterday just because they're quite nice to see the variation in what we can do so this is Maria which is so you can just see her I'll show you her like there. Um, you can see, just a second, it's, it's quite fuzzy. Um, maybe if it pause. So there's Maria, Zen, and this is Coda, because I'm going to show you the Create Materials, so then you can see Create Metahumans, so you can see what they originally look like. And so Coda drew, drew um, this, then so that was one of the characters. Um, then this is Maria. Um, you can see here, that's Maria. 
This is Zen. Yeah, so you can really see how like quite different Hannah's results are compared to what she started with. Another thing that is interesting to just like raise, it's like basically what you're doing is you're like playing with the genetics and then altering it, but digitally. And you're also like, you kind of like genetically mix and matching, digitally genetically mix and matching. But obviously like the thing with this metahuman, this is like, they, what is good about learning this is they will release like something better than this. Like this is to get people interested in, in it. So when they release it as something like more, I'm sure a lot of the frameworks will be um, more developed and yeah. more intricate. I and really also, believe that. And also with Unreal, like what's really amazing about Unreal is like they just, they have a lot of, <laughs> because they have a lot of money and because they, they do have like a very much like, they, they have like a mega grant. So they invest a lot in like plugins. So there's, so, and they really believe in like, like, um, connecting all the softwares to each at one another whereas I say um like uh Facebook has like lots of like I know it's not a software but they do work with the like, Quest and Spark AR but they like don't they, they don't like cross platforming like doing things cross platform to other companies um so what's it's enabled is it's enabled um Unreal to like have so many potential pipelines that you can work with that's why the meta human we think is really valuable because even if like at the moment you might just be doing a um you might just be having it so that the character is speaking and saying something and then it's just like a nice background it's maybe from head up maybe in the future you can have it so that um you know it will you because now you know this it will it will just help you with the other stages of things mm. basically mm -hmm. and with when it has updates which updates tend to be fairly fast yeah i'm gonna carry on screen sharing now because now i'm going to show you how to how you go from building your meta human in the browser to bringing it into unreal so once you've made your meta human the next stage is kind of is actually like bringing it into unreal and so that's where using the software bridge comes into play. So bridge is like, like I was, it literally is a bridge. It's a bridge between metahumans and Unreal. And also like this other, um, you can go on the website, which I've linked. You can go directly to their mega scans and they have a bunch of free materials um, that you can download that are really high fidelity as well. Um, so in bridge, um, I'm going to kind of like, demonstrate this but I don't expect anyone to follow along because it does require you to have everything installed um, but what I'll do is I'll explain it and you guys will have this document so you'll be able to kind of hopefully when you come back to doing it again in your own time you'll be familiar with the process anyway because I've explained it but yeah just let me know if you have any questions or interrupt me at any time it's completely fine um, so yeah the next step is you actually have to download Bridge. And once you've got that installed, you have to log in. So when you open Bridge, it will probably look something like this. Um, and there'll be this icon here, which I'm already signed in, but you just need to sign in with the account that you use to create your, with your Epic Games account, basically. And it's really important that you log in with your Epic Games account, because otherwise you won't be able to find your meta humans. They'll be lost in the metaverse somewhere. Um, so then once you've logged in and you're all set up in Bridge, the next thing that you do is you just come down to this icon here, which is just uh, the meta humans icon, and it will open like a sub menu and you can either use one of their preset characters directly or you can click on my mess humans and then you'll be able to see the characters that you've made so i was working in this earlier and i hadn't made this character and it's just popped up so it is really immediate like if you make a new character now it's going to pop up like directly um so to download a character or like bring it into Unreal, what you need to do is you need to select the one that you're working with. And when you select it, it will open up this menu here. Um, I actually always work with the, the pre-default settings, but you can adjust the resolution. So like I would go with 8K just because you will get the detail that looks really like a meta human. Um, but 
if you're working on a small project or maybe your computer's not doesn't have the best processing power you can go for 1k or 2k resolution and they'll still look good it just won't be like super crisp um so i stay with the default settings and all i do is you just click download um and you'll see that it starts to say generating um it can take, I mean, for me, it can take like 20 minutes to generate it and then like another 10 or 10 minutes or so to actually download it because it's it's such a like richly detailed asset that it just has to spend a bit of time like kind of compiling it all together. Um, so I'm actually, because I've already downloaded one and exported one, I'm going to cancel this just because just in case my computer gets overwhelmed um and also just because we won't have time to wait for it um so i'm going to cancel that now and let's just imagine that i've down generated and downloaded this character which is the character that i already have set up so once you have your character set up the next stage is to actually open an unreal project and then you'll be able to export it directly so if you're not familiar with Unreal, the way that you create a new project is you have to open the Epic Games Launcher. So I really always have that in my, um, what's my bottom bar here, so it's really easy to access. So when you open it, it will open up this little kind of small browser and you just click directly on launch Unreal Engine 4.26. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm explaining things quickly but it is really detailed here like you'll be able to read all the instructions um and you'll see the screenshots with little arrows that kind of tell you exactly what to do so also don't feel like you have to make like tons of notes because it is already kind of prepared for you um so yeah so unreal can sometimes take a bit of time to launch for me um, but there we go, it says it's launching now and what it should do is it will open up, yeah, here we go, it will open up, um, it will open up the engine and it will load with like a starting screen where I can either open a new a project that I've already made, an existing one, or I can create an altogether new one. So I'll just show you how to create a new one just so you guys have seen the process. Um, so what you do is, yeah, so either select or create a new project. So to create a new project, you just select games and then you click next. Um, always just click blank template. Like these other things can be useful, but for what we're doing, a blank template is perfectly fine. And then you click next and then you can either choose to build it with the starter content. So that's just a bunch of assets that will come with the cat with the project so you might have some floors you might have some walls like um some chairs and tables like some really basic assets like and a quite a, quite a lot of materials actually which if you're new to unreal like i always build it with the starter content because sometimes you can just take something that's existing and tailor it to your own needs um but if you don't want to you just click here and click no starter content um then you can navigate to somewhere in your hard drive or on your computer to save it so i'm just going to save it in the same folder as before um and then you can rename it so just like my project one is fine or like maybe meta human test or something whatever it needs to be so then you just click create project um and a new project should be loading so you'll be able to close this window and close that window and if i go to my desktop let me see um you'll see yeah this you'll see that it's loading so it's, it's generating a new project for me now um so that should be quite quick because it there's not much going on <laughs> um and when that's done i'll show you what to do in terms of bringing in the character which again, that can take a couple of minutes um, or maybe five, 10 minutes. So rather than us kind of waiting and watching that, because I've already done that, I'll just explain the process and then I'll skip over the waiting time and go into the project that we're already working, that I've already set up because it, it will just be faster and less boring. So 
this is what Unreal looks like when you have a brand new project. Um, so I'll just briefly explain the interface. You have the content browser, which is where you'll find all your assets. Like, um, because we imported it with the starter content, there'll be architecture, audio, uh, materials, particles, just a bunch of things, but I won't go into further detail. Then in the top left-hand corner, uh, right-hand corner, sorry, we have the world outliner, which is actually where you can select the assets that are in your level. Um, and so obviously this window is your level. You can use your mouse, um, left and right and middle mouse buttons to navigate. And then you have the place actors, um, which is quite useful. So now to bring it, now you've got your project set up. You have bridge installed and you've downloaded your character. You just need to export it. So to do that, you just click on export and it will automatically start the export process. So that can take a little bit of time just to connect um, and just to kind of like uh, get working properly. Um, but what will happen is eventually there'll be a loading bar that comes up and it will import everything exactly as you need it to be. Um, and because the MetaHumans use several features which are not, uh, they're a bit more process heavy, you have to enable some inbuilt plugins. And those plugins, um, there'll be a notification that just pops up similar to this one that just says like, uh, oh, let me just zoom in. so this one says manage plugins or dismiss. But once your MetaHuman has imported, it will come in with something that says like enable plugins and you just need to click that and it will restart your project. And then you will, um, then you'll be ready to get started with actually setting up your project. Um, so I hope that makes sense so far. If you have any questions, again, just let me know. I'm actually gonna close this project and now I'm going to show you um, in the existing project that I already have, um, the plugins that you need to be set up with. So I'll scroll down because we've gone over this. So yeah, so the next plugins that I need to enable are the AR kit plugins and also the HDRI plugin. So the AR kit plugins enable me to connect to the iPhone Live Link. Um, not like the, the Unreal Live Face Lick. And what that does is that enables you to do the live facial animation. Um, so they're really three essential plugins. And then it's not essential, but I think it's quite nice. Oh, it's crash. I'm just going to restart that. <laughs> um, so it's not essential, but the HDRI plugin, I think, is a really nice feature that allows you to create a scene you don't have to build any assets you can just take a free image from online to create an environment so that's really useful if you just want to kind of test something or um get to the end of this workshop um the kind of process and actually kind of render something out that feels quite finished um so when my project reopens um i think it's likely crashed because uh I've, I've had it open for quite a few hours now and been on Zoom, so and this laptop's a little bit old, but hopefully that shouldn't happen for you. Um, yeah, so in terms of while that loads, I'll just talk a bit more about the HDRIs. Um, so the HDRIs, like I said, they're these, they're these kind of, um, oops, they're these kind of cube maps, and there's this really great website that I've linked in the PDF here, um, where you can download, honestly, hundreds of them, and they just create like small, it's almost like being inside of a globe and the image is projected onto the globe behind you. Um, and the cool thing about the HDRI plugin is that it actually kind of maps some of the lighting that is reflected in the image. Um, so I'll show you that in a minute. Um, Cool, so now we have this open. Um, I will show you the plugins and how you install them. Um, it's just in the settings and then plugins. And all you do is you come up to the search bar and you just search for ARKit. 
and I've already got them enabled because this project is already set up, but they'll be unticked. So you just, um, actually, I'm just not going to untick it so I don't change anything, but you just tick them to enable them. And then again, you just search for HDRI and enable it. Um, and I don't know why Unreal does this, but once you install the plugin, you always have to reinstall, re like restart the project because that means that it just like uh, activates the plugin basically. Um, so once you've done that, uh, you will have like a, this is the level that I've already created, but I'm actually gonna create a new level so that we can start from scratch and I'll explain how you place the character in, how you place the HDRI in, and then we'll get to the animation. So with new level, I'm just going to select the default. And then once your metahumans have imported, there'll be a folder called metahumans. And um, common is like just a bunch of assets just, you just don't need to touch, they'll just be there. And then Kken was the name of the character that I was using. So all you do is you open up that folder and then you find this thing called BP Kken. Um, it should be the only, the only asset that's not in a folder in the root folder of Kken. Um, and what it is, is this is a, a blueprint. Um, so that means that it's all set up for you um, and it should be quite like uh, straightforward now. So you just drag it and drop it into the scene. So then I'll, I'll just rotate around so you can see it a bit more. Um, there we go. And I kind of, to be honest with you, what I like to do just to make sure it's really organized is I'm gonna delete this floor because I'm gonna use a 360 map so I, I don't need it. Um, I technically, I don't need the player start. Like this is something that I always find really annoying because when you go into the simulation mode, it always loads you up in a weird place. So just, you can just delete that. And then I sometimes just make folders just to make things a bit easier. So I'll just do like the environment, for example, and I'm going to pop in the atmospheric fog. So that's an environmental thing. The sky sphere, which we can probably delete in a minute, the light source, and then also the skylight and the sphere reflection capture. Um, you don't need to know too much about what they are. They just always come in with the, with the, um, with the default level. And then we're left with the BP KKN. So if I select that and press this plus button here, it will create a new folder. Um, and I'm just going to call the folder like character, for example. And it just means that like as you as you start to work on more complex projects, like you can really easily have hundreds of assets in your scene. And it just it just helps to kind of like have good practice with keeping that organized, I think. Cool. And then so now we want to add our HDRI. So in order to do that, we need to come up here to place actors and you'll just search for HDRI backdrop. And this is another blueprint, so it means that everything's kind of already automated for you. You just drag and drop it into the scene. And so this is like the preset image that it comes with, which isn't so exciting. But what you do is you can just use the, the pivot point here just to kind of like, maybe you want to center it underneath the character. Um, you might want to make sure that the floor is the same level as the feet, so you can just kind of pull that up. You can see I've gone too high there. So maybe something like that is quite good. Um, and then, so now I'm going to kind of show you, I, in the project file that I'll send you guys or that you have access into in that drive folder, there's a folder that I've made called HDRI where I've already actually downloaded several HDRI images and imported them. But I'll just run you through that process because it's super simple. You just come to this link, which I've, I've linked in the PDF, select one, choose your settings. I think 4K is pretty good. Make sure it's on HDR and then click download and it will download automatically. So then to change the background in Unreal, um, 
you just make sure you've got your HDRI backdrop selected. Um, which, where is it? Um, oh, here we go. Make sure you've selected the details panel. And then you'll see in the underneath HDRI backdrop, there's this cube map property. And you can just change it by dragging one of these images. Um, that was not so good actually, but you can kind of see it creates different, different worlds. Um, so that's really easy. And there's also a few that come preset with Unreal. So feel free to play around with that. But to import your own image, um, like the one you've just downloaded from HDR and Haven, um, you just, you'll find it in your download. So all you need to do is just literally just drag and drop it. And then you'll see this will load up. It might take a couple of seconds. Um, there we go. And again, just drag and drop to change it. So can you see now that I've dragged and dropped that, it's actually a bit blurry. There's a really tiny trick that you can do just to uh, kind of maintain the quality. So you just double click it to open it. Um, one second, and it will open up the properties. And you just scroll down here to the MIP gen settings and you change it from texture group to no MIP maps, which um, hang on a sec. There we go, no MIP maps. And then you just click save. And when I close out of this, you can see that it went, it's gone from being actually quite blurry to being more in detail now. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep this one for now. So now we've done this, we've actually, we've basically set up our level and we're ready to start doing the facial animation. So to set up your, um, the facial animation, you'll need to have your iPhone ready with the, um, with the app already installed. So that's the Live Link Face app, which it's linked in the document, so you'll be able to find it quite quickly. So in order to set it up, you need to um, you need to know what the IP address of your of your laptop is. And both your laptop and your phone need to be connected to the same Wi-Fi. So to find your IP address, you just open up the command prompt um, and you just type in IP config and when you press enter it will come up with a bunch of details but the one we need to remember is the IPv4 address and that's what we need to once you've opened the live link app on your phone you just go to the settings and you plug in that plug in those that address underneath live link and you select add target and then you type in the IP address I've put the instructions for this in the document. And I'm also, I think there's some screenshot, phone screenshots that I'll upload and put in the document so you guys can see exactly how, exactly how to do it. Um, I'll just jump ahead a bit so I don't spend too long explaining like the pernickety bits, but that's basically it. So once you've done that and you've got your live link set up with the same IP address as your computer, you can close this. And then you can open the folder with the character and select your character. Then in the default panel, you'll see this live link, LL link face object. And underneath it, it says LL link face head. And we should be able to just see um, my phone. It should just connect. If you look over here, can you see it says Florentine's iPhone? So that's the iPhone that I'm connected to. Um, so you make sure that it says that. Um, and you also make sure that you enable live neck face head because that will animate the, uh, the neck movements as well. So you'll get quite a human uh, animation. I can just go through the step-by-step -step instructions. Um, and I know, I know because it's been crashing, it maybe looks more complicated than it is, but when I go through these instructions, I think you'll see it's really, it is just a like number of, just like ticking some boxes. Okay, so this is where we were. 
um, imagine that this is what I was doing just now. I'd selected the, the BPK10, which is essentially the blueprint of the, the metahuman character. So in order to then like activate the facial animation, um, what you need to do is you'll just come up to here where it says play, and then you right click play, and it will, there's a little button that says simulate. And when you press simulate, as soon as you press simulate, it will connect to the facial animation to record it so that you can actually sequence something. You can have a recorded animation clip that you can then um, you can then sequence and then render out as a as a, like a final film almost. You have to come up to where it says window and then it will say cinematics and then tape recorder. And you click on tape recorder and that opens up a completely new window um, and what you do from there is in the world outliner you drag and drop the BP Kken so that's the blueprint of the character you drag and drop it into the source um, and that's the next thing you need to do is you need to go into simulation mode um, double check that your facial animation is working so that's how you um, see whether it's working you press press play, it will simulate and then the face will start moving with your face. Um, and if that's all working correctly, then you just press, uh, so that's, sometimes if you open the tape recorder, it will come up with this, like some of the buttons in the toolbar will be missing. So you just press that right click arrow to find it. Then once you click play, you just press the big red, red button to record and it will show you that it's recording so it will come up with this like three two one and like kind of like old school cinema style um so then you can like do your facial animation maybe you want to talk maybe you just want to do like idle looking around even something really simple can look really beautiful and effective um so record for however long you like and then you can just press this button in the top corner which is stop um so once you press stop, it will come up with this, this like loading bar and that will just be, that's basically loading the assets that you've just created. So you've created several animation assets for the body and the face. And then it will also create a sequence that's already set up for you. So you actually don't have to um, reconnect anything. So yeah, once it's saved, what you need to do is you will just go back to your content browser, which is over here, just over here. It's like where all the assets in your project file are. And you need to select cinematics, which will be a new folder that's created when you take this the facial animation recording. And it saves it in takes, and then it saves it in a folder with the date in which it was recorded. And then so you'll have like take one, take two, take three, for however many takes you, you want. So you need to collect, so the scene that I was working in was actually the third take I took. So you just need to collect, click the, the sub scene folder and there'll be a, um, there'll be an animation sequence there. And it will likely be called something like BP, the name of your character, scene one, take three. Um, so then you just need to double click that to open it. And then There'll be a few things that you need to do before you're ready to actually kind of like create a short film. So once that sequence is opened, you'll notice that there's, um, this is the timeline here. And over here, it's a bit like, it's a bit like in the world outliner, it details the assets that you have in the scene. In the sequencer, in this panel, it details the assets that you have to be sequenced, so that's to add an animation to. So the first thing you'll notice is if you scrub through the timeline, it actually appears that there are two characters. And this is because I've done screenshots so you can see this. So at least, even though I can't demo it, at least you have a reference point. Um, so you'll notice that there are two blueprints with the same name, except one has this tiny little lightning bolt. And that's because when you open the sequence that has saved from your facial animation recording, it, it has another blueprint inside of that sequence. So the first thing you'll need to do is actually to hide 
the, the face, which isn't animated, which is the original one that doesn't have the light being built. So to do that, you just select the original one. You come down to the sequence set, the, the details, and just select actor hidden in game in rendering. And that will make it uh, invisible when you render out the footage or play the game. And then to make sure that you can't see it in the level, also you can just toggle visibility by clicking the, the eye. So you can see where I've got it selected. There just, um, there isn't an eye. It's just like a kind of blank oval. Um, so once you've done that, uh, you'll then be able to like scrub through and you'll see like the, anim the character is animating correctly. But once you've got rid of the second body, you'll notice something weird is happening. And this is just a bug in Unreal and it's really easy to fix. And you just scroll down in the panel of the, um, of the sequencer and you'll see that next to body underneath there's like an animation clip. And you just need to de delete that and it will just like reconfigure it and it should work absolutely perfectly. Um, so that's quite a simple step to fix it. So now what you've got at this point, you'll have your character in the scene, you'll have a, a simple environment and you'll have a facial animation. So the next step is, like I was showing you at the very beginning of the demonstration, which seems like years ago now, <laughs> um, I showed you that short video clip where it was like the camera kind of panned around the character as they were looking around. Sometimes the focus change to be more, more kind of focused on the eyes than more overall of the whole face. Um, so that's the next and final stage is setting up the sequence. So that's what Hannah started to explain by pulling in the, the scene camera actor. Um, you can either do it from the uh, panel, the place actors panel, or you can right click this arrow here and there's like a little option to select create camera here and it will create a camera from the point in which you're viewing. Um, so Hannah, Hannah demonstrated this, you can right click the camera uh, to pilot it. And so piloting just means viewing it from the point of view from the camera. Uh, it's quite good to be in pilot mode when you're sequencing because you have a lot more flexibility in terms of how, what angle you find, because you can move it with the, mouse rather than like adjusting like uh, a location value. So it's much easier like that. Um, so Hannah was about to show you how you create a new sequence, but what I wanted to say is that you've already got a sequence set up um, for the uh, for your facial animation. Uh, there's one step I missed that's quite important. I'm really sorry. I'll just go back up. When you open your um, when you open that sequence, there will be a lock that is actually locked, so you can't actually interact with any of the things on the left hand side. And you just need to override that by ticking, like pressing the lock to unlock it. And then you'll be able to like edit things like, for example, get rid of the body animation clip here. Um, and just generally like add the camera to the sequencer so you can sequence it. So once you've done that, which should have been the first thing, you just drag the cinema camera actor and drag it into the sequencer and it will appear in the, in the panel here. And you'll have those settings such as current aperture, current focal length and manual focus distance. And so with these, you can adjust the focus and the, like, the kind of the depth of view of the, of the camera. Um, so then, You'll need to, in order to kind of create your sequence, I'm sure some of you are probably quite familiar with working with keyframes. So you'll need to um, create keyframes in order, in order to sequence like the movement of the camera. So a keyframe, it just like kind of like locks it in one location at one point of time. And then if you do another keyframe, say 10 seconds later, it will move from point A to point B, like keyframe A to keyframe B. Um, and it, in Unreal, it will automatically do that in, in quite a smooth motion, which is really good. Um, so then to create a keyframe um, of the location, you need to press the plus next to transform. And then you can move, then you can scrub along in the timeline 
maybe in a few seconds and say, oh, I want to position my camera slightly more zoomed in and slightly less in focus. So to do that, you just um, find your new location, click the plus sign um, when you found your new location. And then to change the focus, you can change it with the manual focus. So you just need to like adjust that. Um, you can normally click it and drag it to the left or right and it will adjust it um, automatically. Um, but what is really useful is that there's this thing called the draw debug focus plane and that helps you to really, I mean, I think if you're quite familiar with it, you don't really need to use it that much, but if you're first starting out, it's really useful to help you understand like uh, what the boundaries are for the getting in and out of focus with the, uh, the subject in front of the camera. So you can see that it's selected and at 20, at, with a manual focus distance of 21, it's quite like, uh, it's focusing really on just the main features of the face. Um, so that just gives you a bit of an idea of how to sequence and render. Um, below, I won't go into detail because I think it's quite straightforward, but below I've also detailed how you can actually render out the, um, the footage as either a PNG sequence or an ABI, both of which you can open directly in, in something like Premiere and then you'll be able to export it as an MP4 or a MOV. And then you'll have like a short, little short video that's like really high quality. Um, hopefully you've got some cool facial animation in there as well. And hopefully you've learned some new things along the way.